good evening. My name's Anna Hodra and I'm from Plunkett and I'm one of the National Educators and we're here to wrap sleep tonight. Yeah. And I'm Robin Sweeney. I'm a psychologist, but I'm a sleep researcher and I've got a special interest in sleep of mothers, families and babies, especially in that first year, so newborns particularly. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks, Robin. Yeah. And we thought perhaps for the best session of 10 minutes that we were going to cover some just of the how sleep develops and what you might see and some of the cues and things like that. Yeah. So it'd be good. I think because I think sleep's one of the things that parents worry about a lot. Mm -hmm. We get lots of advice and information. And um, if, if sleep's not going well, then other things you know, don't seem to feel mm -hmm. like they're going so well as, as well. So I think it's good to get a bit of basic understanding about how sleep happens for newborns and then we can go from there. And so sleep develops um, along a sort of a tra tra trajectory, a little bit like um, in the same way that babies learn to move, so they have to learn to crawl before they can walk, there are certain things in sleep that have to unfold in time. So babies don't come into the world ready to sleep all through the night and be awake all day, as, <laughs> as we know. Yeah, don't we wish? Don't we wish there's that magic <laughs> Um So when they arrive into the world, Anybody who's got a newborn, you'll know that your baby's sleep happens all around the clock. So there might be little sleeps of 45 minutes, and there might be a two-hour sleep, and then there might be a one-hour sleep, and there might be a longer one than that. And very often, if you observe your baby in those first weeks, you'll see that there's one at least long chunk of sleep in the 24-hour period. So you may get a chunk that's three hours or maybe even four or five hours if you're lucky um, in those first weeks. But it may just be at what we sometimes say is a socially unacceptable hour. So you may be getting that big chunk of sleep from 11 in the morning to mm -hmm. 7 in the afternoon. So, oh, only that was at night. So and the first thing is wake at night. And all the babies that wake at night. So the yeah. first thing is don't panic. Yeah. Don't okay. panic. <laughs> um, that's a really good sign that your baby's able to have those longer patches and it will move to the night. And there's some things that we can do to help support mm. that. Um, but with all of that, one of the things that babies need to do uh, as part of the development of learning to sleep for longer at night and overnight is to, to be able to be awake for longer, actually. So they need to get their waking sorted a little bit first. So when, once they can start going for longer waking periods, then they'll start to push those long periods of sleep to the night. Oh, okay. And you'll get more of that, what we call mm. consolidated, so joined up mm. sleep at night. Um, and one of the things, there's two big things, processes that, that help us sleep. So this is the wee tiny two minutes worth of science. And mm -hmm. we might <laughs> this. But there's two key things that help babies and all of us sleep. One is something called sleep pressure. And so for you and I, Anne, when we woke up this morning, from the minute we woke up, we started mm -hmm. building up sleep pressure, pressure for sleep. And it keeps building and building and building until sometime tonight when we go to bed, maybe about 10 or 11 mm -hmm. o'clock, we'll have enough pressure to to fall asleep and hopefully carry us through the night. So little babies have really high sleep pressure. So they've got big pressure for sleeping and they have to have to big pressure. The pressure builds up, then they have to have a sleep. When the pressure builds up quickly, then they have to have a sleep and that happens around the 24 hours. So we can use sleep pressure to help us if we understand how it works. And the other thing is that we have an internal clock that determines when we sleep. And so for our adults, Adult humans, we're designed to sleep at night and have our big sleeps mm -hmm. at night. Babies haven't quite recognised that yet. So one of the ways we can help them with the clock and with the clock getting stronger and getting the signals more coordinated is to make the distinction between day and night quite clear. So when babies wake up in the morning, it can be a good idea to have those first feeds and maybe the first nappy changes and some bright light, mm -hmm. so maybe near a window, mm -hmm. um, spend time in the bright light and get lots of exposure to, to light and activity throughout the day. And it helps the clock start to develop and learn the difference to be able to differentiate between night and day. So I've been hearing a bit about like phones at night time mm -hmm. and that keeping... The, the parents awake yeah um so and it can impact babies as well uh, so our eyes are designed to detect um visual clue cues so we can um, see things but also light and that the the receptors that receive the light that sends a message straight to the brain that says be awake be yeah. alert and we know that in our devices our phones and our tablets and our computers they emit um, a lot of light, but they particularly emit blue light. And our eyes, as it happens, are really receptive to blue light, and that's very alerting mm -hmm. for us. 
So one of the tricky things for us if we're using those things at night, and I can understand if you're up at night and you're feeding a baby and you think I might just check Facebook or message a friend who's up at 2 o'clock in the morning feeding <laughs> as well, so I don't yeah. feel so lonely. Mm -hmm. There's that real temptation. But two things are happening, or three things actually. You're getting that cue to your brain to be awake. Mm -hmm. So it might be harder for you to go back to sleep mm -hmm. yourself. There's also some evidence that maybe some of that light is going to the baby as well. And we're pretty sure that babies' eyes, because they're brand new and they're pristine, they'll detect the light even more strongly okay. than we do with adults. So it could be affecting them in sleep. Keeping them awake they're too. Keeping them mm -hmm. awake as well. And then the other factor involved in that is, is the content of whatever you're looking at. So if you're reading some emails or some information that's a little bit distressing or annoying, mm -hmm. or then you've also wound yourself up emotionally. So I know it's tempting and I know it can make you feel less lonely, but maybe put the phones away. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. yeah. So you're saying sort of more bright light during the day mm -hmm. to get them into that day and night yeah. type sleep and at, and at night time keep your lights low. Lights low. So in the day, I often get asked, you know, should I close the curtains and things mm -hmm. in the day? And certainly in those first few months, I'd encourage the baby to be exposed to the natural day just as you are mm -hmm. and to your natural activity so that they get plenty of stimulation during the day as, as to the routine of our house and when things happen. Because the other thing that helps the clock develop is the baby starting to align with how things happen in our house. Mm -hmm. So when we have meals, mm -hmm. when different things happen. So with the little babies, I don't think it's necessary to close curtains, have them exposed to lots of light in the day. Then in the evening, as you're winding down, have a wind down time for everybody, everything gets a little quieter, we don't have play time, quieter voices, and then um, dropping the lights down, so maybe turning the main lights off in the room and just having a lamp on. And certainly when when you're up at night trying to have the lowest level mm -hmm. light you can get away with to actually see what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, sometimes people will hear it said that when you're getting up at night um, to do the feeds and the changes that are inevitably going to happen, that you are very military and business-like. And I think that's, that's kind of not fair mm -hmm. for mum and baby mm -hmm. or whoever's up at night with baby. It's not fair to be like that. So I certainly still be with your baby, acknowledge them, but it's not fun time. It's not party mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. it's, this is what we do. We have feed, we go back to sleep. Um, so keeping it and what about the different types of mm. sleep? So there's the one where the baby's quite active, and yeah. <clears throat> a lot of parents say, you know, they're almost like making noises yeah. and quite noisy, um, and then they're really quiet yeah. sleep. Mm. So what are the differences between those? So as adults, people have often heard about the different types of sleep that we have: mm. REM sleep, mm -hmm. REM sleep. People have have often heard of in non-REM sleep. So that's the non-REM is when very deep, deep sleep and the REM is when we dream of mm -hmm. things. Babies, it's not quite that well developed. So they have um, lots of sleep that I call mushy sleep, mm -hmm. <laughs> transitional sleep where they're mm -hmm. going through those stages. But we do see quite clear periods of time when they're either in the active sleep, which is like our REM sleep. So if you're watching a baby, you may see them pulling little faces and grimacing mm -hmm. and you might see their eyes open. Mm -hmm. They can snuff them and grunt and fart and you know, mm -hmm. all those kind of noises. And it can be kind of tempting to think the baby's waking up or they are awake. So if your baby's been asleep or going to sleep and they're doing that, give them a moment. Don't, mm -hmm. don't dive in there. Because you can imagine if the baby's in their active sleep and we think, oh, I want to get in there before you wake up and I don't want you to cry. I, mean, I don't want to upset you, but we whip them out of bed. Mm -hmm. But they're actually in this nice phase of sleep. They just look busy. Mm -hmm. It can give them a bit of a... Right, and, and then they're wide awake. Then they're wide awake and you've lost the opportunity yeah. for sleep. So there's that. And then when they're in the very quiet, deep sleep, that can be a little bit scary sometimes because you look at them and they're so still. Mm. And you're like, oh, gosh, you know what? Are you breathing? So again, try and keep your hands to yourself and just give them a bit of time and they'll do it at some point right. and then they'll know. So they cycle through those um, through the night or through all of their sleep, they'll cycle through those. And in the newborn, in those first couple of months, their sleep cycles last around about 45 minutes. And um, often when they're changing from one phase of the sleep to mm -hmm. another, they'll almost wake themselves up. Mm. And so if you, if you can, it can be useful to either just give them a moment to resettle mm -hmm. Or you can you have a little opportunity there to try and help them resettling, but without getting too close. So that might be just jiggle their bed a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, it might just be use a soothing voice. Mm -hmm. Anything to do see if you can help them roll back on mm -hmm. into another cycle of sleep. Mm -hmm. So sometimes um, 
that can be helpful for parents if they're not sure which way the baby's going to go. So just stand back a little bit, maybe out of view, and just watch and see what's happening. And almost say in your head, prove to me that you're waking up. Prove mm -hmm. to me that you're really awake <laughs> before I dive in and muck up mm -hmm. your sleep cycle. Because mm -hmm. you might, you never know, you might get another another round. So what about cues? Uh, you know, people talk about baby cues um, and tired signs tired and things, signs like, and things that. like that. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's really confusing when you're early into your parenting career or each unique baby is going to give you just mm. different signals. So even if you're an experienced parent, every baby's going to give you different yeah. signals. So yeah, I like to think about cues. Um, so that's from day one, it's, it's, it's your your greatest asset that you've got as a parent, I think, is to be able to spend lots of time looking at your baby mm. and just thinking, what are you telling me? What is it that I need to understand about you? The important thing is that you won't know to start with necessarily, mm. and that's okay. But by spending plenty of time looking at your baby and talking to them and just seeing what happens with different things, you'll start to understand some mm. of their cues. But the sorts of cues that they can give are things like um, they may have been looking at you quite intently for mm. a while, so that's a cue that I want to be engaged mm. I want to be talking with you and then they might just look away and that's the sign not necessarily that I'm tired or I'm hungry but I need something different so my job as the parent or the adult here is to try and have a go at figuring out what that might be so they might look away they might stare into space they might yawn which doesn't necessarily mean I'm tired mm. it means I'm just regulating myself mm. a little bit and I'm getting ready for what's next some babies might sneeze some might get the hiccups some do quite kind of jerky mm. movements they might um, do little coughs, they might change colour, especially in the newborn mm. stage. So you're just looking for little changes that say, maybe my baby's ready for something else. Mm. And as I say, that could be I'm ready for a feed, I'm ready for sleep, I'm ready for um, a different um, experience. Mm. Mm. So that's probably a few things for us to be going on with for now. And uh, yeah, we'll come cool. back again shortly. Okay, thank you.